like I say, go to the Remix button, hit the Remix button. That way you'll have this video and, and keep up with this. Otherwise, you know, YouTube's just going to control us, guys, and it's, it's really bad. Government researchers have found radiation around the plant may be decreasing. They found levels within 80 kilometers dropped in the year leading up to last November. Officials from the science ministry checked more than 140,000 locations. They measured radiation one meter above ground. And they used a helicopter to take readings in the air. They found radiation decreased by an average of 40 percent. They estimated half of that came through natural decay. And they suggest wind, rain and other environmental conditions dispersed much of the radiation. It's the oldest trick in the book. The Distortion of Truth by Association Book. People in Japan are preparing to mark the two-year anniversary of the March 11, 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Over the next 10 days, they'll be remembering what they lost that day and sharing the lessons learned from the disaster. <laughs> Japanese actress Keiko Takeshita performed at a gathering in the northeastern city of Sendai. She gave a vivid reading of passages based on survivors' accounts. A cello and piano provided accompaniment and photos of the devastation appeared behind her. Memories sprang to me like flashbacks. It makes me cry. What I experienced was beyond words. The reading reminded me of the suffering two years ago. Tohoku University's International Research Institute of Disaster Science organized the event. Institute staff want to convey survivor experiences to future generations. They've already collected the accounts of about 800 people. They plan to pass these on through similar reading events and via their website. Tokyo Electric Power Company says about a thousand firms have not renewed contracts with the utility because they object to higher electricity charges. The firm asked its corporate customers to accept an average rise of 15% last April. TEPCO is struggling financially. Its reliance on energy imports has increased since the March 2011 accident at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. It says most of the 217,600 companies and factories that had to renew contracts by the end of January have agreed to the rise in electricity charges. But about a thousand of them are still using le electricity without paying their bills. TEPCO plans to seek their understanding for the increase by explaining its cost-cutting measures. It says some corporate customers who renewed their contracts have complained about firms obtaining free electricity. TEPCO says it will have to cut off companies that do not renew their contracts for a long time. Thank you very much, everybody. The debate goes on about the need to construct or restart nuclear plants, but Japanese regulators are also busy drafting new measures to protect the facilities against external threats. The Nuclear Regulation Authority, or NRA, has convened a panel of experts to gather their views on nuclear security. The panel held its first meeting in Tokyo on Monday. It includes eight experts on nuclear plants, counterterrorism, and national security. NRA officials are looking to introduce additional background checks for plant workers. The checks will cover criminal and financial records based on the employee's consent. Officials also want the panel to discuss possible scenarios if terrorists try to intercept a ship of or a shipment of nuclear materials. The regulators plan to define specific measures within one year. Their discussions will involve police, 
Coast Guard, and other authorities. The governor of Yamaguchi Prefecture in western Japan has put off deciding whether to renew a land reclamation project to build a nuclear power plant. The plant at the coastal town of Kaminoseki was stopped after the Fukushima Daiichi accident in 2011. Chugoku Electric Power Company last October filed for an extension of the project, but Governor Shigetaro Yamamoto rejected the request and asked the firm for explanations four times. They failed to agree. Yamamoto said he will give the firm a year to come up with more details on why the plant is needed as part of Japan's energy policy. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says he will review a former government policy against building the plant. U.S. authorities have decided to use a Japanese government fund for disposal of ocean debris created by the tsunami that hit its northeastern region in March 2011. Some parts of the large floating debris field have already reached the Pacific coast of North America. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration says it will use part of the $5 million donated by the Japanese government to dismantle a floating dock that drifted from Japan. The huge dock was found in the state of Washington in December last year. The dismantling work is estimated to cost $630,000, of which nearly $480,000 will be covered by the Japanese donation. NOAA officials say the rest of the Japanese fund will be distributed to five states facing the Pacific to help them clean up tsunami debris in the future. One estimate has roughly 1.5 million tons of tsunami debris from the disaster two years ago drifting across the Pacific Ocean. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is deciding whether the country should take part in the TPP free trade talks. But he is meeting some pretty stiff competition from farmers. Abe has now told their leaders that he will keep their interests in mind in making his decision. Abe met with executives of the Central Union of Agricultural Cooperatives on Friday. Now, the head of that union, Akira Banzai, told Abe that agricultural cooperatives in the country are against Japan's participation in the trade negotiations. He said that's because the elimination of all tariffs is a condition for joining the talks. Banzai gave a written request to Abe. It said the government must keep farm products like rice, wheat, beef, as well as dairy products off the tariff elimination list. Now, in reply, Abe said he doesn't intend to go against his election pledge last December. His Liberal Democratic Party said at that time that it would oppose participation in the talks as long as elimination of tariffs, without exception, is kept as a precondition. Lawmakers in Japan are wrestling with their own economic problems. Officials at the finance ministry say the national debt will reach nearly $12 trillion at the end of March next year. That debt will be more than twice Japan's gross domestic product. It'll work out to more than $94,000 per citizen. Still, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is increasing public spending as part of his plan to revitalize the economy. He wants lawmakers to pass a draft budget bill worth about $1 trillion. And he wants to issue bonds worth more than $460 billion to cover a shortfall in revenue. Government officials are trying to come up with ways to get the deficit down. They plan to show their proposals this summer. A major Japanese trading house will be exporting shell gas from Canada. Mitsubishi Corporation has become now the first firm in Japan to gain an export permit from the Canadian government. Mitsubishi is among four foreign companies to obtain such approval. The others are Royal Dutch Shell, China National Petroleum Corporation and Korea Gas Corporation. They're planning to export liquefied shell gas from the western province of British Columbia. They'll be able to ship a combined 24 million tons of shell gas a year for 25 years. Mitsubishi plans to start exporting the gas to Japan by the year 2019. Japan does need to secure stable sources of energy 
to make up for a sharp decline in nuclear power generation following the disaster here in March 2011. Iranian leaders are showing little sign of bowing to pressure to curb their nuclear program. The head of Iran's atomic energy organization says officials there are building 3,000 new centrifuges. Scientists will use the machines to enrich uranium, material that could be used in a nuclear weapon. Fayda Dunabasi made the announcement just days after talks between officials from Iran and six world powers. He said scientists will decommission machines currently in use and replace them with advanced centrifuges. He did not go into specifics. But analysts with the International Atomic Energy Agency say the new models are far more efficient. They said last month that the Iranians had started installing 180 machines at a facility in the central city of Natanz. Diplomats from six major powers offered last week to ease economic sanctions if the Iranians agreed to suspend enrichment of uranium to 20% purity. Beyond that point, scientists can quickly move toward material that's weapons grade. Iranian leaders say they are refining uranium for peaceful purposes. Offshore wind turbines can provide power to communities while satisfying the demands of environmentalists. In the past, engineers had to anchor them to the seabed so they could only install them in shallow waters. But now, some engineers have developed a turbine that floats, and a group in Japan is working on refining the design. The Goto Islands are 140 islands and islets in southern Japan. The surrounding seabed is uneven, and strong winter winds cause high waves. It's difficult to install fixed wind turbines. This is Japan's first floating wind turbine. It's a demonstration project the Ministry of the Environment has been conducting since August. The trustees of the project are three private companies, a research institute, and a university. It is a small-scale test turbine capable of generating up to 100 kilowatts of power. The designer of the turbine says because it's floating, the biggest advantage is that it can be put anywhere in deep seas. If floating turbines can be put into practical use, renewable sources of energy will be utilized more. I wanted to make a contribution toward making that happen. Utsunomiya uses a plastic bottle to demonstrate how the wind turbine floats. The submerged part is called the spar. It contains a weight as well as seawater to keep the turbine upright. Much like a fishing float, the wind turbine doesn't sway much, even in strong winds. Now, many countries have got their eye on floating wind turbines. However, there is a big obstacle to overcome before they can be used widely. It costs much more to construct a turbine that floats in the sea than one that is fixed. To reduce costs, Japan's test turbine has an innovative feature in its submerged spar section. Usually spars are made totally of steel, but Utsunomiya developed a hybrid spar using concrete for its lower part. It's the world's first floating wind turbine with a spar using this inexpensive material. To prevent the turbine drifting away, it simply needs anchor chains to be sunk. No complex equipment is needed. The simple design of the turbine is geared toward mass production and is the key to cutting costs. The turbine also incorporates an idea that makes it more efficient than any previous models. Usually, the rotor blades of wind turbines face slightly upward to avoid touching the post. With a floating turbine, this means the wind can easily knock it backwards and it catches less of the wind. This causes a decrease in power generation. In this demonstration, a wind turbine is designed to catch wind from behind. As the turbine leans forward, it catches more wind, increasing power generation by about 7%. This kind of technology will help deal with global warming only if it's widely available. I'm really happy to see the technology taking its first steps towards practical use. Engineers will continue to work hard, aiming for their wind turbines to be floating offshore around the world as soon as possible. The people at Japan's Ministry of the Environment hope to start tests on a full-scale floating turbine next month.